uh, we have David uh, Francis, who uh, from Blue Star, who's flying solo, regardless of the uh, the session. But uh, looks like playtime is over. So best practice AR for utility, brand, and business, and. We're all good with AV, so uh, David, whenever you're ready, take it away. Great. Hi. Uh, so good to be here, all the way from Sydney. Uh, long time AWE fan, first time speaker. Uh, so today I'm speaking about Playtime is Over. Um, I've been to uh, speak with um, a hell of a lot of major media agencies, creative agencies, and now more so CMOs and CEOs and CFOs and I've got some insights into really what's, uh, what's going to move us forward, I believe, as an industry. So just quickly about us, um, we're Australia's largest communications group. Uh, we produce um, 70 to 80 per cent of all the magazines and catalogues in the Australian market, so very much below the line. Uh, we've got more than 3,000 clients, most of the brands in Australia um, we have some sort of relationship with. We don't really deal with agencies um, at the moment. Uh, we have more than 500 um, client-facing people heavy ongoing invest investment in the AR space, uh, which is really nice, um, but it's very much a big leap of faith uh, and in myself, but we're really, we're really going for it in our market. Uh, and more than 70 full-time uh, creatives in our team and expected to double in the next year, especially with our interactive capabilities. Uh, what I've discovered as I've been going out um, and talking to people is that there is no AR vacuum. There are no AR budgets. So when you're talking to clients, if you do manage to convince them that AR is a fantastic tool and it could work in with their brand, one of the problems we encounter is where does the money come from? Where do they actually find it? You know, um, we're dealing with a below the line communications piece, which is print, which is still the most robust um, way to do augmented reality. Um, David just talked about moving extended tracking and slam and all that sort of stuff. It can get shaky, reflective surfaces, all that sort of thing. Yeah, so print is still the most robust way to do AR. And it's a massive, massive industry. And it's in pain. And it needs measurability. So if the key to having a good startup is to find an industry with the most pain and, and develop tools for them, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, here up on the screen is from Zenith Optimedia, um, the ad spend for next year, media spend, um, and AR isn't on there. So really, that's a big challenge is uh, for us to talk to our clients about where you source this money from. And really, um, ultimately, when it comes to media spend, we're trying to say to them that we are the most measurable, accountable media channel. And stop believing in the Facebook impression machine. Stop believing in HTML5 web banners. And start believing on eyes, on screen device, on graphic. Things like dwell time. David mentioned we've got to up our stakes in the metrics and analytics. We really do, because we have a unique medium here in augmented reality if we only just use it properly. So how do we create that demand? Uh, when I first went out a year and a half, two years, might have been more, God, I'm getting old quick, um, talking about augmented reality to people, um, I was selling AR. I was like, AR is everything. AR is coming. It's going to change the world. It's the next internet. The next internet will be overlaid upon the world around us. And now I actually have backed off from that because we've got some great tools, great tools like Kachoom, like the SDKs that are out there. There's some robust technology in the AR space. You've just got to find what works for you as a developer. Um, and then I say to clients that really now it's 90% user experience, customer journey, and brand strategy. And in fact, um, I'm having to learn some of the language of all of that, even though I'm kind of more so an AR guy and I want to talk in terms of um, computer vision and SLAM and um, natural feature tracking and all that sort of stuff. So what we do is we go and talk to clients. We then look at their business outcomes and we reverse engineer the AR creative from business outcomes and ultimately try and find their greatest pain points. Uh, so really the creative part comes once we've gone, what are you trying to achieve? Um, you know, and, and the other thing is you've got to do it on the spot. Uh, right now you do because we don't have these beautiful case studies as David mentioned yet. So you've got to sell them on the spot. They go, okay, okay, we're an accountancy company. So what do we do in AR? And bang, you've got to come up with it right then and there and show them that it can relate to them and then maybe you can move it forward and hopefully find a compelling event to make them lock in a budget to. I like to say, and I just had it up there, but augmented reality is the easiest thing to sell and the hardest thing to close. You will get a meeting. You call someone up, I'm an AR guy. When can you come in? Fantastic. I'll get the whole team. Let's put screens up. Let's do... And then at the end, OK, so when do you want to spend some money on it? That's hard. So we go to the business first outcomes. You're trying to acquire or retain 
and you're trying to measure or um, call to act, buy, path to purchase, huge. All these brands are spending massive money on digital. They're getting these analytics and impressions, but they can't see the actual connection between their digital spend and bricks and mortar retail. They can't see how people are coming into stores. Augmented reality has the capability to do that. You know the UUID, they activated it in their home uh, in Cupertino, uh, and then they travelled into San Fran and they went to a store and they redeemed another 10%. That's a path to purchase that other digital channels, ha channels have a lot of trouble tracking. You tie in things like Bluetooth, geofence, all that sort of stuff, contextual marketing, and you've really, you're closing the loop in a way that brands are, are um, stinging to actually have solutions for. Um, great, great quote from Seth Godin just the other day. Design at its core thrives when a human being cares enough to do work that touches another. It doesn't thrive when it gets more efficient. And I think sometimes in the AR world, we all concentrate on efficiency and tools to publish and all this sort of thing. And, and they're there and they're great. But at the end of the day, it's about making the experience a human experience, even if you just give people a moment. Let the audience in. Give them a moment when they forget about the technology and they go, oh, wow, that heart beats or that barbecue exploded out or let them forget for a second and then you've got them, then they're in, emotionally invested. Promote, promote, promote. David was saying that before. Make them put a call to action all over the front cover or just cut and run. Say, you're not ready yet. Let's do some augmented reality six months down the track when Sergey Brin's announced the glass is out and everyone's panicking that they haven't done augmented reality. If you're not going to put it all over your cover, if you're not going to support it with above the line advertising, social media, all that sort of thing, then let's just not do it because you only have one chance to make a first impression. Integrate into TVC, social media and newsprint. Don't silo AR. Don't do the campaign on its own. Actually have it feed from the TVC. What? The television commercial, we call them TVCs in Australia. So what's the content in the television commercial? How can that translate into the, um, into the space, into the AR space? Don't push the envelope too hard. Simple AR done well is enormously effective. Uh, repurpose clients' assets, they love that. Even if you look, it looks like you're repurposing their assets, it's a massive tick with their CFO. Oh, good, you took marketing assets and you've repurposed them in an innovative medium. Fantastic. Um, and have a strong data and privacy policy. If you're dealing with Australia right now in any capacity uh, and you're storing data, um, you will know that just two months ago there's hardcore regulations. If you're storing data offshore, you will be massively accountable for it and a lot of brands are panicking in Australia. So where you store your data is really important. Um, I like to equate augmented reality to theatre. Uh, really, it's not like film. You can't choose how people witness it. They will witness it like this amphitheatre from any one of 10,000 different angles. So you place the experience in scene and then the, you have to let the audience just witness it and make their own meaning from it. Because no two experiences will ever be the same. You can't control them. Stanley Kubrick would hate AR um, because he can't frame the shot. Uh, don't just some of the UX design stuff, and I know I'm sort of running out of time, and I really want to hear Matt because we've got similar legacies of being in the AR and print industry. Um, don't reset, repeat AR experiences. Loop them. Um, don't do anything that feels broken. The slightest moment in AR right now can make people feel technologically inept. Make the user move and get down on the X, Y axis uh, for contextual relevance. When they see their world behind, it makes a, a world of difference. Um, suddenly it's in their own home. Suddenly it actually advances the meaning of the scene. Use plain and positive language at all times. Think of going to a Vegas casino and what happens when you pull the thing down. It says, congratulations, you're amazing. You, you actually pressed the button again. <laughs> For audiences, in Australia, 80% of stay-at-home mums um, play a mobile game once a day. And the reason they do is because they get positive reinforcement from it, according to studies. They get told, you're amazing, you're incredible, because they don't hear that often from their husbands when they are working their butts off at home. So use plain and positive language. Don't use extended tracking as a feature. Strange, David was saying the same thing. Slams, not quite ready yet. Reflective surfaces and all that sort of stuff um, can be really prob problematic. And if suddenly a couch skews like 45 degrees, um, the user, bang, again, we've got to be careful in our space. We can't make people feel technologically inept. And use 2D as if it's 3D. I really like what the Blipar guys do, um, especially in the UK. They must have an awesome creative team there. They do really nice 2D floating buttons um, and it caches in really quickly to the device. Sometimes that can be really effective, especially if you've got exclusive competitions and everything there. Um, bridge the cache payload. That's a given. Don't make people wait. Give them some messaging in the meantime. Use the audio and please use the audio because 
Audio used well in augmented reality closes the loop on experience where you have audio, visual and kinetic. And of course, kinetic is the strongest path to memory. When people are moving, it actually, they're spatially aware, the peripheries are activated, their fight and flight mechanisms are activated, and any messaging they get, storytelling goes into their subconscious. Any uh, neuroscientist will tell you that. And working with print, I work in print. Um, so no gloss, uh, no gloss uh, finishes and no foils. Um, and, uh, and really, I mean, coming back to it, at no point should the user be made to feel stupid or technologically inept, or otherwise they won't share. I've had heads of innovation of massive companies accidentally put their finger over the lens and the experience stops and they go, oh, oh you, you do it, you hold it. Because people are afraid that they'll look stupid in this space. Don't let them look stupid. And measure, 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 measure. David said that. Um, if you're not measuring, then you'll be smashed by the comm scores of the world. We have an opportunity. If we measure this medium, and it is the most accountable media channel, it's actual eyeballs as opposed to footfall near a billboard. If we actually measure it, then we can actually make the media agencies spend money on us because they get audited to spend the money in the, most, in the best way. And if we're the best way, then all the money's coming our way. We get monetized and we get to have a lot more fun uh, with our platform. And iterate. Don't do campaigns, build channels, build revenue and change industries because we're able to do it. We've just got to back ourselves, not get run over by clients, say, if you're not going to commit to this 150%, then we're not going to do it because our industry can no longer afford to um, just do a gimmick because it'd be nice to get 40, 50K from this client for a 3D animation and a dancing doll on top of a page. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Very good presentation there, David. Lots of good information. Uh, any questions while the next speaker gets set up? Okay. Ah, we have one up front, and then I just ask that you repeat the question, please. You said that uh, Slam wasn't ready. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? So I've got a creative team of 70 graphic designers who I'm trying to teach to create markers that will track well. Um, you can put it in the v 4 target manager, for example, and get four or five stars, hopefully. But trying to teach users to understand that you need contrast in your world and you can't have plain, non-reflective surfaces is another level altogether. It's hard enough training graphic designers, let alone training users, that if you move over there and you've got carpet and there's no pattern, then the camera's going to freak out. Uh, yeah, you can use some accelerometer stuff, but, um, and, and, and the other thing is, um, just in relation to that, don't let users print out markers, because their print settings, if they print it 10% smaller, a three-seater sofa becomes a 2.7-seater <laughs> sofa. Just thinking of the IKEA one and, um, yeah, being able to push it off to the side. It, it can skew, and unfortunately, we just can't afford that in AR. We have to be so robust because it's a little scary for people. It's the future. And any other questions? Ah, we have one uh, that's over there. All right. Can I ask you from here? Uh, I don't, I, well, I guess you can ask him across and then I just ask you to repeat the... Uh... Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you if you can give us an example of how you closed the sale that was tough in the print industry, which looks like the most easy to sell to. Uh, in, in the printing industry, how to close the sale is um, really we talk about pushing and pulling audiences. So we say, well, let's do something that's uh, like an acquisition thing first. Let's bring the audiences in and then let's do a retention thing. So in Australia, they have retirement living. Um, you can put down a 10% deposit and within two years, you can pull your money and run. So they have people drop out over those two years when they buy off the plan. So how can we put a retention tool in place um, in order for people to come back and re-engage and if you, they're not re-engaging, uh, they might be going to a competitor. And actually, if we put a geofence around their competitor and we, it pings us that they went there, then how can we try, well, then give them a call, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just really drawing that out for customers. And also talking about campaign number four, because you don't only close the loop with path to purchase, how do you then keep going in the loop? Um, ad agencies love to do one-off campaigns, whereas we always talk about the first four campaigns when we're talking to clients keep that loop happening, really. Great, great question, David, for David. And um, so, so thank you again. Thank you. And